Hello, everybody. As Paul, as Saul said, I'm Norma Levy, president of New Plaza, and we are a nonprofit film community. Our curator, Gary Palmucci, has chosen uh, this wonderful 1996 award winning film, Fargo, for today's talk back. Gary will be joined by film historian Max Alvarez and by the journalist and documentarian Todd Melby, who has recently published a book on the history and the making of Fargo. So thank you for joining us. And um, Gary, please, uh, please begin. Well, thank you, Norma. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Happy uh, Oscar Sunday. We've got a very special episode of the program uh, uh, in store for you today. <clears throat> it's the 25th anniversary of uh, a film that won a couple of Oscars on Oscar night uh, back in the mid 90s. And I think that uh, of all the American filmmakers born in my generation, which is at or around the mid 50s, who've amassed a body of work, it seems to me that uh, the Coen brothers, Joel and Ethan, uh, are first on the list right now. Now, some may make the case for Spike Lee or Jim Jarmusch, but I think the Coens have developed a unique uh, visual and, and thematic signature that movie lovers are gonna be revisiting and debating uh, for decades to come. Uh, and today's film, Fargo, along with uh, the one they made right afterwards, The Big Lebowski, I think are at the top of their list in terms of films that I, I know movie lovers, including myself, constantly revisiting and debating and finding to be kind of moving targets in their unique mixture of uh, comedy, tragedy, uh, screwball dialogue, outrageous violence, uh, and uh, just, just some special brew that we keep coming back to. It's, uh, Fargo is a movie that I've even watched once uh, with my son at five o'clock in the morning. Maybe we'll get to that story later in the broadcast. Um, but Max, I think uh, in unveiling the trailer now, as we usually do, this looks like one of those trailers that the Coen brothers had a personal hand in cutting, maybe with some help from the late lamented uh, Gramercy Pictures marketing department, but uh, looks pretty, pretty personal by the standards of trailers to me. It certainly does capture the essence of the film and Gramercy Pictures was a very director friendly pseudo indie distributor affiliated with Polygram and other companies. And uh, they encouraged the eccentricities of filmmakers and the Coen brothers. It was a perfect match, at least in the case of Fargo. So here is we're going to take a look at the original Fargo trailer or, or one of one of several. And uh, uh, one of several trailers that came out when the film first opened. Let's let's take a look. I'm uh, Jerry Lundegaard. You got the car? You bet. Brand new burnt umber Sierra. You want your own wife kidnapped. Her dad, he's real well off. So why don't you just ask him for the money? Ah! See, these are personal matters. Personal matters? I'm... Wait, it's Jerry. I don't know what to do. It's my wife. We gotta talk. It's something hard, geez. It's terrible. So I got the state looking for a Sierra with a tag starting DLR. I'm not sure that I agree with you 100% on your police work there, Lou. I think that vehicle there probably had dealer plates. Jeez. DLR? No, they said no cops. Here's the second one. So we got a trooper pull someone over. This a new car then, sir? Oh, it certainly is, officer. Still got that smell. There's a high-speed pursuit. We got a shooting. And then this execution-type deal. A million dollars, a lot of damn money. They got my daughter. Are you, hon? Brunch is some lunch, Margie. What are those, night crawlers? Oh, yeah, looks pretty good. How's Jean? Who's Jean? My wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, the little guy, he was kind of funny looking. You were having sex with a little fella then? Yeah. Mr. Lundegaard, you mind if I sit down? Carrying quite a load here. Where's Jerry? I got your damn money. Now, where's my daughter? Jeez. Blood has been shed. We now want the entire 80,000. I answered the darn. I'm cooperating here. You have no call to get snippy with me. I'm just doing my job here. What do you fellas got yourself mixed up in? Police! So, is there anything else you can tell me about him? He wasn't circumcised. Oh, well, yeah? Yeah. 
Now, up until this time, the Midwest was something of a mystery to people who weren't from the Midwest, anywhere other else around the country. You, you saw films set in the Middle West, but they never went to the extent that Fargo goes in trying to capture a, a Midwestern accent, which we can talk more about, especially when Todd joins us. But uh, the, the big in-joke here is the Coens, the Cohen brothers themselves hailed from Minnesota. And somebody at some point in a moment of weakness, I think was lamenting that they never make any film to acknowledge their roots and be careful what you ask for. They ended up doing a Minnesota film in the case of Fargo. Yeah, and I think also another one of their very best films in a completely different uh, take uh, on the suburb that the Coens grew up in in Minneapolis, I believe it's called St. Louis Park, A Serious Man from 2009. Not nearly as popular as Fargo, but highly recommended to anyone who appreciates their uh, their, their their signatures. Because you did, de you definitely see the the Cohen brothers touch the in that film as well. The very the very dry humor, and in this case in Fargo, it's uh, it's about almost a half an hour in when the tone starts to shift and it becomes a much more intense narrative after some fairly comedic setup for the first reel or so. And uh, that just is part of the Coen brothers uh, style of, of telling it's kind of a story. They, they seem to have emerged almost kind of fully formed into the movie world with their first movie, uh, uh, Blood Simple. They didn't seem to have an apprenticeship of making uh, high profile shorts or television work. I, I remember seeing Blood Simple at the 1984 New York Film Festival and the Coen brothers were up on the stage doing a Q and A afterwards. And uh, Ethan Coen revealed that prior to the start of shooting of uh, Blood Simple, he had been working as a statistical typist at Macy's. And I, and I thought to myself, well, there's hope for all of us if uh, he's advanced from, from stat typist to uh, producer of Blood Simple, which they apparently raised the money for uh, in, the, in their home state. That's the... Uh, I, I, I'd heard that as well, Gary. And then right after Blood Simple, I mean, their second film, feature film was Raising Arizona, which was a, you know, primarily we can think of as a Hollywood picture. And all of the films they made afterwards, even Fargo, their serious entertainment industry funding behind them, yet they were always able to re retain their voice, their, their somewhat rebellious uh, uh, voice in, in storytelling and filmmaking, which it's a combination, and, and I know we were talking to Todd about this the other day, it's a combination of an academic knowledge of film history and also of uh, a close connection with popular culture. It's, it's emerging there in, in what the Coen brothers do. Uh, I think a remarkable combination of, of three things, uh, talent, smarts, and, you know, as E.B. White said, uh, luck. Uh, that's that sustained uh, you know a career now that's almost coming up on forty years old, believe it or not, since since Blood Simple. And this was uh, particularly unique because you have the Frances McDormand role of Marge that was created for her. It was a role that was written for her, which. Was, as many of us know, is a luxury for actors. You don't often get, get that opportunity. And she had already appeared in, she had appeared in Barton Fink, she had appeared in Miller's Crossing, she had appeared in Raising Arizona, but this was a major, major breakthrough for her. Although uh, one of my favorite filmmakers, Ken Loesch, uh, who's not as well known, gave her a major a co-starring role in his film, Hidden Agenda, about six right. years beforehand. That's right. So this certainly was one of her bigger, bigger roles since Hidden Agenda and also Dark Man, the Sam Raimi film. Her first, or certainly that was, that was her first uh, lead, I think, in, in a film in, in, in the Ken Loach. Well, I, it seems like Fargo has kind of taken on a life of its own, uh, probably way beyond what the Coen brothers uh, even dreamt of when, when they wrote it. And uh, the, the, I think today, you know, the, uh, and, and, and I, I know Todd Melby, who, who will bring on shortly, will have a lot to say about this in his new book about the making of Fargo. Uh, there's going to be a screening around the country next month uh, of, of celebrating the 20, 25th anniversary of the film. And I have a feeling that those screenings are gonna be kind of like laugh fest somehow. The, the, the seriousness of the film, which I think is considerable and the tragedy of it have kind of taken a back seat to this uh, up what seems to be now an uproarious parody of the, you know, the, the, the manners and wars of, uh, you know, Minneapolis and, and environs. 
It's going to be, I think, March 2nd and 5th is when Fathom Events is going to be doing these special screenings on the big screen. May, May actually. Or I'm sorry, May. May. Yeah. Another another month that begins with them. You know, as a, as a fellow Midwesterner, I'm from Wisconsin, but I know Minnesota fairly well. And in watching Fargo, it, it, it caused a bit of a co conflict between Midwesterners. Was the movie overdoing it? Was it accurate? There, there were definitely moments that struck home for me, even as a Wisconsinite, little touches like when the Marge is going to the all-you-can-eat buffet. Uh, that is a staple of Midwest, uh, Midwest luxuries, where you're paying one fee for as much food that's available, and you just keep piling it on your plate there because it's only $7.99, and you don't get charged again for a second portion, and you can get one of every dessert. And, and so they, they captured that very well. I also remember after seeing it in the cinema a couple of years later, it was on cable television, and I was watching it with a friend who had lived in Minnesota for a while, and he was a bit annoyed with all the, oh, hey, you know, yeah, he thought they were overdoing it. But he, but he loved that last scene in the car when Francis McDormand is driving the, the crazed killer uh, associate of Steve Buscemi. And she's trying to rationalize this crazy man's behavior. And uh, she's saying, you know, and for what? For a little bit of money? You know, there's more to life than a little bit of money, you know? Don't you know that? And here you are, and it's a beautiful day. You know, I just don't understand it. And my friend said, that is Minnesota. That's what somebody in Minnesota might say when they're trying to rationalize the insane behavior of a, of a crazed killer. So some elements uh, he was able to connect with. Well, that's when that's when both Francis and the film really have to deliver the goods with something there at the end when the, uh, that gentleman, Peter Stormare, who's an Ingmar Bergman uh, veteran. I, re I recently saw him in a Bergman TV production uh, and it's, 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 a, it's a long ways from Stockholm, but he, but he did a beautiful job. Came from Sweden, uh, he had appeared actually on, on a lot of television programming as well. And then uh, this was one of his first uh, American feature films. He is also gonna be directed four years later by Lars von Trier in Dancer in the Dark and also by Vim Vendors in Million Dollar Hotel. And then the, Far uh, the, uh, the Coens will use him in, in Big Lebowski after Fargo. Ah, and then he'll be doing more television. About that. Well, we can't underestimate the contribution of, of William H. Macy. Uh... Oh. In, in the in the lead role, his his one and only Academy Award nomination. Um, you know, he was he was a close associate. I think originally a student of uh, David Mamet's at at uh, Goddard College up in the state of Vermont. And and Mamet at one point, in his usual sardonic style, was saying, "Well, you know, whatever went right or went wrong with our early theatrical productions, and they had a long history." He said, "Billy could always act," and I think <laughs> and I think that's uh, you know true then and and, and true now. And two, uh, two years before Fargo, uh, Macy had starred in Mamet's film version of, let's see, this was, this was the... Um, o Oleana. Oleana, thank yeah. you, Gary. Oleana, a completely different part where he's playing an academic facing a harassment suit. And he had to fight for this part in, in, in Fargo. And I know Todd will tell us more, but from what, or what I read on one interview, he basically said, I want to do this, in, I want to do this audition again, because I'm terrified you're going to mess it up and give it to the wrong actor. And, uh, and he was able to just really carry the picture for an, an actor we, we usually associate with being a character actor. And then Steve Buscemi. I mean, my, uh, he's almost, uh, it's almost a who's who. L reading his filmography is almost a who's who of indie, uh, indie films from the 19, late 1980s throughout the 1990s. I think Steve, watching this again, he almost gives almost kind of a feral performance and he, and he, he takes more punishment and dies more, more ingloriously than just about any, any character I could think of in a, in a, in a similar role. It's really amazing. Yeah, he's had, he had some very intense collab. I mean, it was in some very intense films. He was directed by Abel Ferrara. Uh, Terry Zweig, Zwigoff, Zweigoff directed him several times. Jim Jarmusch, and of course, he was in Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. So he was that gritty go-to character actor uh, for intense movies, but he could always deliver a comic element to his part. Uh, there's something engagingly innocent about his smarminess, if that makes sense. There's it's, an innocence there. It's, it's just, it's just, uh, <laughs> you know, he in this film he is he's horse whipped with a belt, he's shot in the face, he's attacked with an axe, and of course he winds up in a in a memorably and glorious uh, uh, place at the at the very end. 
And then he's okay. also going to return uh, for the Coens to appear in the Big Lebowski and also the Hudsucker proxy as well. So there's a the Cohen brothers, and I think what what stands out, and we see an example of that here. What I've come to appreciate about their films is that the tremendous detail that goes into casting even the smallest walk-on characters. Yeah, uh, it, it, too many times in these streaming series and cable series that are set in a, per a period story, people look too modern, but uh, whether they're doing a film like uh, you know, Barton Fink or uh, uh, Hail Caesar, every character actor looks of the period. Just as in the case of Fargo, there aren't any glamorous characters characters, even the prostitutes are not glamorous looking. They're, they're very authentic to what you would associate from a rural, from a rural area. Well, this might be a good time for us to bring on uh, Todd Melby and, and uh, he'll tell us about his book, A Real Labor of Love, which uh, put together over several years. A lot can happen in the middle of nowhere. Todd, have I got the title right and complete? Uh, pretty close. Yeah, a lot can happen in the middle of nowhere, the untold story of the making of Fargo. So what, what did you find out that was most surprising and revealing in the, in the course of uh, your research? And I know you went far and wide from coast to coast, as you were telling us, so with, your, with your research. Yeah, there's just so much to learn and to know about you know, the people that make a movie. Obviously, the Coen brothers and you guys have talked about a bunch of the actors, but also you know, the behind the scenes folks, so the cinematographer, uh, the costume designer, the, the sound designer, et cetera, et cetera. So I really did go all in on you know, trying to learn as much as I can, including talking to the um, uh, the special effects guy who figured out what exactly should be spewing from the wood chipper. Like, should it be like chopped up little pieces of pork and chicken, which was what they tried at first. <laughs> it, looked like, it looked a little too gross. And Joel was obsessed with having all the snow be red, wanted it all to be red. So then they switched to propylene gly glycol, which is a kind of antifreeze and put some dye into that. And so that's, that's how they came up with all that, all that red to the, you know, to the side of the wood chipper. Well, in, in our conversations this week, I think to me, one of the most interesting things, you kind of tracked the progress of the screenplay and you found mm, an early yeah. draft of it almost uh, by accident uh, at UCLA, that this screenplay was pretty much uh, as is almost from the start, what we see on the screen with a couple of, you know, small but important additions. But they definitely had all the structure there. I mean, the entire structure was there. I mean, as you as you guys said, they wrote the role of, of Marge Gunderson for Francis McDormand and the role of the kidnappers for Stormare and Buscemi. Um, and the whole structure was there, but the pe the pieces that were missing, probably the key pieces were the, the Mike Yanagita scene wasn't in the original screenplay that I read from the UCLA library. Um, he's the guy that has drinks with, uh, with Marge down in the hotel bar and tries hitting on her. Uh, no, no, you can sit over there. Uh, so those scenes I think were, or that scene was critical and there were two other references to him that I think helped, helped her develop as a character quite a bit and also helped the story proceed. Cause it's for that reason, once she found out Mike was lying that she ended up going back to question Jerry again at the car dealership. That's true. That's, 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 a, that's a nuance that uh, is now just, you know, the light bulbs going on my on in my head. That's that's a sm small but critical and uh, adept addition. Yeah. Well. Yeah. You, I mean, you you, re you think about it enough, and you talk to lots of people, and reread it, and reread it, and obviously you end up seeing more and more. Todd, I'm sure you talked about this more when you did your wonderful program on Fargo for New Plaza Cinema Online. But this movie did well when it came out. It was a success in 1996, but then it just took on a life of its own over the last 25 years. Any theories as to what led to that phenomenon that Fargo became? I think part of the reason is, is, is that super warm relationship between Marge and Norm. I mean, here's a married couple that aren't just married, but they truly, truly love each other. They enjoy each other's company. You know, he brings her the Arby's. <laughs> you know, she brings him the worms. Um, they're just a really, a there's, the, there's like a warm beating heart in Fargo that there isn't in so many other Coen Brothers movies. I mean, you know, you know and, uh, their critics have called them cold and Fargo mm -hmm. isn't cold. Fargo is, is warm and funny, despite all the mayhem and violence. And, you know, what, uh, identifying the elephant in the room here, 
All right, we have the Cohen. You can tell us more about the Cohen brothers' background because they also came from Minnesota, right. and but uh, they came from a comfortable background, and you can tell us more about their family. Sure. Are they making fun of regular working Minnesotans here? Is this kind? Is there a cruelty that runs through this film that isn't quite fair? Any theories about that? Well, I can tell you a little bit about their their family first. So their sure. father was an economist at the University of Minnesota. Uh, he was recruited there by, by by Walter Heller, and their mother was an also an academic. So she ended up working on her PhD while the Cones and their sister Deborah were young. She ended up teaching art history at a Minnesota college. So they grew up in this very educated background where where their parents were both writing. You know, so they also saw their parents reading and writing a bunch, but they also saw you know, American TV from the 1960s, F Troop, Lassie Come Home, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and then they end up seeing some highbrow movies too, because their parents would sometimes just take them over to the University Film Society and see Fellini's Eight and a Half. So they were getting this like high and low culture without any, anyone telling them what was high and what was low. It just all became this terrific mix for them. And then as far as like, are they making fun of Minnesotans? I think it's, I think they're, I think they're, they, they put us, you know, they basically showed a mirror you know, to, to us being, you know, us from Minnesota, North Dakota, us being Scandinavian Americans, uh, they saw what we really sounded like often, and especially like how we acted, like our passive aggressiveness, our, our politeness, even though things are really, shouldn't be polite, like it's this disturbing belief that, uh, like things can be normal, you know, things can be, if everyone would just follow the rules and be polite, everything would be fine. <laughs> yeah, but that's not going to happen. Well, you found opinions both pro and con, I think, in, in doing the book, right? Yeah, I mean, when the movie first came out, lots of Minnesotans didn't like how they sounded. And, <laughs> but yet, you know, it's, it's true. There are people here, especially in, the, in Northern Minnesota, Northern North Dakota, um, from small towns when there was a lot less travel, you know, that had that unique sound of, you know, with the long O's and the long, A's and you know that that kind of you know the sound that we hear in the movie that we enjoy that's uh, often there. Yeah. Yeah. As a native New Englander, I've tried and failed miserably to uh, to do some of those lines. I, I am not going to do it today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I see I see some traces. Once you get to Wisconsin, we we do have a little bit of that. You know, it's going to be snowing today, and uh, we, we because of the you got the German and the Polish immigrants. Sometimes the verbs get confused, you know, throw the baby down the stairs a toy was an old, you know, Wisconsin joke. But for me, there were, even though what, this is not Minnesota, but even in Wisconsin, when I was back there a few years before uh, Fargo came out, and I was reminded when Frances McDormand inter inter interviews those two prostitutes, they have what we in Wisconsin called mall bang. Uh, this is a haircut that a lot of girls would get at shopping malls, not very fashionable at the salons there, and they all look the same. And so they had kind of a late 80s look of, of mall bangs. And, uh, and the other thing that, I, that's, that made me laugh, it's one of those, if you blink, you miss it, when Frances McDormand is at the coffee shop and there's that young girl behind the counter and she's just smiling at her. It, it's one of those seven second re, uh, shots of the, of the girl that you'd have to be from the Midwest because you'd never see that in a New York coffee shop, that kind of friendliness that's kind of piled on thick. And, and exactly. Todd, you spoke to at least one of the actresses, uh, one of those two uh, young ladies playing the uh, the working girls who saw who saw herself in the trailer and other, and her friends of hers weeks before the release of the film, unbeknownst to her, she was in the trailer and apparently her life her life changed dramatically as a result. At least absolutely. You know, I ended up I interviewed both of them. So Larissa Cokerno played Hooker number one. So she's the woman that you see on the left side of the screen, and uh, Melissa Peterman played Hooker number two. She's on the right side side of of the screen. And Melissa Peterman has gone on to you know, be a quite successful actor. She lives in Los Angeles. She was on the TV show Reba. Um, she's quite terrific. And then, and then the other actor, Larissa, it's hard to say Larissa and Melissa at the same time, <laughs> Those two very Midwestern sounding names, but Larissa uh, chose, to, chose to do theater. And she actually spent a lot of time with Frances McDormand and the film's dialect coach before they started filming because uh, Larissa's accent was so fantastic. They actually had Larissa come up to uh, Francis's room and just speak in the accent for many, many hours and just have a conversation so that so that that sound would just go go into McDormand's head. 
for some reason, correct me if I'm wrong, but the accent that really seemed to be right on the nose was uh, was William Macy's wife. Is it Kristen Rudrud? Yeah, uh, Rudrud. Yeah, Kristen Rudrud. Rudrud. And, and she's originally from Fargo, North Dakota. Okay, because she just seemed to nail nail it. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. She knows the people. She knows the mannerisms, and also she she was able to. Um, she told me the story of how she was swimming. She was taking like a um, one of those aqua aerobics classes at the Fargo YMCA or YWCA, and she's take, taking the classes um, with some other women. And one of her one of her friends said, "Say hi to your mom," in this really <laughs> high pitched kind of kind of nervous voice <laughs> that was kind of masked by like you know the sort of porcelain smile of of the upper Midwest. And so Christian said that that say hi to your mom that kind of nervous nervousness like is like it's 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 not here in your chest when you're an actor like it's higher and higher and go, actually goes like above your nose to like this almost panicked panic tone so then like if you see her you know Christian Rudrud in the movie playing the you know the wife of William H Macy and she's you know chopping up the carrots that very first scene when Macy you know comes into the house or the first time we see them together you know she says like how is Fargo like she's she's already panicked <laughs> she's just like always tuned in and panicked. I always get annoyed in any movie set in the Middle West or East where there's snow involved, especially these days of computer generated animation. It always looks phony, but here you can tell they were shooting under real snow conditions. Am I right there? Uh, well, definitely the outdoor scenes, um, you know, with the triple homicide where Marge is doing the investigation and Buscemi's burying the money in the snow. Uh, those are filmed actually in Northern North Dakota um, you know, further north from where I am right now, I'm at my sister's place in southern North Dakota. Um, so they had, you know, the cones had planned to film those not too far from the Twin Cities, but there was almost no snow in the winter of 1995. So after several weeks of shooting in Minneapolis, St. Paul, they just, you know, folded up the tent in Minneapolis and went up to Grand Forks, North Dakota, and went further north of the Canadian border to find snow. And if you and the next time you watch the movie, if you look at the, the triple homicide investigation scene as the camera kind of pans from Marge and Deputy Lou to the bodies in the snow, you'll notice the, there's some patches where there's, where there's, where there's not snow because it was even starting to melt up north. And that, that beautiful shot of the parking, uh, the overhead shot of the parking garage, that's all fake snow too, right? On the, right, yeah, yeah, that's you know. all manufactured snow. So uh, I interviewed the snowmaker for the book, Dieter Sturm, who's out of Wisconsin. And Dieter had a crew of people and snow machines that, um, that, that, that he and his crew would use to manufacture snow. So they stayed up all night, working overnight on the top of the, the parking ramp at Minneapolis St. Paul Airport with snow guns, kind of waiting for the atmospheric conditions and the barometric pressure to get just right so they could blanket the top of that ramp with manufactured snow. So that, that the scene of the car, I guess Buscemi's car coming in when he steals the license plates, that's all one long shot. And they had, they had one take at that. One, one of our listeners uh, just asked a question I, I know we've all heard before, and, and I know you did some research on this. Yeah. Why is the movie called Fargo? And you even you even went to Fargo and got some opinions on that as well. <laughs> it should be called Brainerd, right? <laughs> well, Joel and Ethan like to joke that the you know the reason they called it Fargo is that no one would go see a movie called Brainerd. <laughs> but Fargo has this like has this mysterious sound to it, especially if you're outside the Midwest. Like Fargo, it just kind of is mysterious. And you know, and I, I think of it, and this is like from a friend of mine, you know he came to this conclusion is that it, you know, it's kind of like Chinatown in the movie Chinatown. It's like most of the movie doesn't take place there, but it's this mysterious place where bad things happen. Right, Chinatown at least is referred to specifically in that film, but Fargo is a little more ephemeral here in, in this case. Yeah, though the very first scene, you know, supposedly takes place in Fargo. That's where, you know, Jerry goes to meet the kidnappers and it's in a bar in Fargo, North Dakota, even though that was a bar in Minneapolis, but you know, so the, it begins in Fargo, North Dakota, and then when Jerry's on the run and he finally gets arrested at the end of the movie, it's, you know, outside of Bismarck, North Dakota. So like the two, so the beginning and the end of the badness is, is in North Dakota. With, with, with that Merle Haggard classic uh, playing on the jukebox, one of the few times we hear a non-Muzak uh, sele selection of... Uh... <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we hear Merle Haggard's Big City. 
That shot that Gary mentioned, and I presume this is the high angle shot when Bill Macy is going out to his car to, to scrape it off. Is it, was that the right. shot you're referring to, Gary, before? With the yeah, I would, I would call that the, the eye of God shot or, you know. Yeah, stunning, yeah. stunning shot. Was that something that uh, was a major contribution by the cinematographer Roger Deakins, who worked quite frequently with the Coens or? Yeah, uh, Ro or, Roger, Roger t t tells the story that they were, you know, the filming the, um, the scene where uh, Jerry asks his father-in-law for the money, like he's a beat, he thinks this is going to be, you know, his, his big break in business, and he gets shot down by the father-in-law, um, and then he walks, you know, disparagingly onto his car, and so we see him, um, he's that solitary figure walking through the snow, so yeah, they had planned to have many cars in that shot, and Deacons saw it uh, with the snow, and just thought it would be terrific with a solitary figure, walking towards a solitary car, alone with his thoughts and his desperation. Um, yeah, so that was just a, a, a terrific shot. Because he had first worked with them on Barton Fink and then the Hudsucker prom, uh, Proxy, and then he went on to shoot many more pictures uh, before, I think, going uh, so, uh, associating with other directors, right? Yeah, yeah, he's, he, you know, he's continued to do a lot uh, with the Coen brothers, but yeah, a lot with other folks too. You know, he was the cinematographer for 1917, won the Academy Award for that, uh, I believe, and then also for uh, Blade Runner 2046, if I have my years right. Apparently the Academy likes to give him his Oscars for his movies with numbers in them. And he was nominated for lots of lots of other Oscars for- Right, and an unusual segue, he went from Fargo to shooting Martin Scorsese's Kundun uh, about the Ooh. Dalai Lama after, uh, after oh. doing this film. Yes. So uh, it was a question. A question I had about um, one aspect. One aspect of the script that. Oh, okay. So you had talked about the the crime scene, where Marge and Lou are there. Mm, uh, right. uh, you know the, the 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 logical question for us forensics watchers and thriller watchers are, where's Where's the FBI? Why isn't the Why isn't it cordoned off? Why you know Why is it Why do they just leave the the the, the bodies there to go get the night crawlers? Any theories about that? Well, it is a movie. It's not a documentary. <laughs> um, so they clearly wanted to have Marge, you know, Marge do the work. And so you know the the one of the stories I have in the book is about the fact that um, Bruce Bonney, who played Deputy Lou. Um, Bruce's initial inclination as an actor was to walk down there with, with Marge and, you know, stand beside her as she, you know, does her lead investigation work. And Joel said, no, 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 you stay over there. You stay on the side of the road. And Bruce is like, okay, I can play that. You know, so he just stands there with his coffee and just says, you know, yeah, and very little else. <laughs> and so I think, you know, when he saw the movie, he thought that was hilarious. Just the fact that, you know, she's doing all the work. She's six or seven months pregnant and bending you know, over and almost losing her breakfast. Right. Yep. And it was just morning sickness. Yep. Now I'm hungry again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, if I can play the the prude, you know, the 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 uh, the devil's advocate, a devil's role advocate, a role you've often played, Max. A role that I've often played, exactly. All right. So, so what are your thoughts on the abrupt shift in tone that the that the film has? And it's not the first movie to do this. I I can think of others that have done that as well, where you've got this high comedy, witty comedy, and then there's moments of brutality that just appear out of nowhere, which appear to be, be the point. Sometimes as an audience member, I kind of feel I'm being pushed around a little bit by the directors, but uh, how, do you, how do you feel about, about the, the, either of you, about the, about the shift in tone that we see in a film like Fargo? I think it's the, facet, the fascinating thing about it to me that keeps bringing me back to it and, and gives it endless repeatability somehow that you it's it's a moving target somehow and, and uh, you know I, I was thinking about uh, we talked about this the other day the uh, epigraph from uh, another film by a director who's perhaps known to be uh, 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 distance perhaps pitiless but I, I, I don't agree but uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick at, in the epigraph of his epic uh, Barry Lyndon there's a title card, which somehow to me is, is tangential here. It says, uh, it was in the reign of George III that the aforesaid personages lived and quarreled, good or bad, handsome or ugly, rich or poor, they are all equal now. 
and most of them are six feet under along with norms and night crawlers, I think. But uh, somehow it's, it's what looks like brutality or randomness to others to me. I don't know, I see, I see something, I don't know if compassion is the right word, but perspective uh, that, that, that's, always, that's always there and, and really gives, gives the film some kind of special uh, gravitas to me that, that never, gets, never gets stale. Yeah, for me, one of the reasons Fargo is so fantastic is because, um, because of, of the specificity and the specificity in their, in their characters and also the specificity in, in how those characters fit into a place. Um, so in addition to adding the Mike Yanagita scene, which is also very Minnesotan, is the fact that you've got this Asian American guy who's suffering in the Minnesota suburbs that you know, are definitely lily white in 1987. You know, he's, he's, he's super desperate and, and sad. And then, and then the other scenes that they added were, you know, um, the Mr. Morris scene, the guy with, with, with the parka who's like sweeping his driveway with the broom. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the prostitutes, like everything about the whole Minnesotaness of Fargo is <laughs> like, is so necessary to the movie. You know, like, it, like that movie can't really be any place else. And it's so, it does such a terrific job of, of revealing what the people who live there are like and what the place is like. And I, think I was, people, uh, th this time around, I was, I was about. doing something that Max and I tried to do with the big sleep a few weeks ago, which is to write down every single scene change and every, you know, basically every, every scene in the script. And you might've tried to do this too, uh, Todd, in your various analyses of the script. And it's, it's such a beautiful and intricate piece of construction. I couldn't keep up. There's just, you know, so many, but every single piece seems to have uh, a purpose. And that's, uh, that's really unique, I think. Yeah, and I, and, and I think it also goes to their, their editing skill. I mean, Joel and Ethan Cohen edited this movie. I mean, Roderick James gets the credit because that's a, a pseudonym that they made up. For, and that they, say, that they say edited their first six films, which of course isn't true. Uh, and so, I mean, to think of like how many directors there are that are also writers and editors, I mean, the whole thing is- Damn few. Is theirs, very, very few, right. That's an incredible piece of information. That's uh, not many people are aware that that's a, a pseudonym for, for the Coens. It always annoys me in far too many movies and TV series when, it, when you see a title that opens saying, based on a true story, inspired by true events. Here they say this is a true story. I, Todd, I know you get tired of being asked this question, but clearly they're playing with us because at the end of the film, they're reminding us that the characters are all uh, you know, fictitious. Uh, what's going on here? Because because we've heard different answers from the Cohen brothers since that time about whether this was inspired about by some events that took place in in the Middle West. Well, I think it's really important that the Cohen brothers didn't say this is based on a true story or this is inspired by a true story. They say this is a true story, and then you know they go on to say that. Um, you know, they've gone to hint that they've actually talked to the survivors, you know, to guarantee its, its authenticity. And then after the movie came out, they say, it is true, it is true, it is true. And then all these years later, they're like, no, 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 it's not true. We were just making it up. Um, so they're, they're just terrific at playing it both ways. Uh, they're terrific at like saying one thing, but really meaning another. Uh, so there are various cases that it may have been loosely based on. There were a couple of cases in Minnesota, one was a kidnapping, the other one was a murder for hire, where the husband hires a guy to murder his wife and he messes it up because mm -hmm. he hires it out to a different guy. So there are some similarities to other cases. And then there's also this case in Connecticut from the 1980s, where an Eastern Airlines pilot um, kills his wife and then disposes of her body with a wood chipper. Mm -hmm. And then at the trial, he was, he was found guilty. Um, and then at the trial, the prosecution uh, you know, plays this videotape of a wood chipper, you know, uh, uh, you know, messing up a, a, a pig, like they just wanted to show the power of the wood chipper. So I got to believe that they got the wood chipper idea from this trial in Connecticut uh, in the 1980s. And then, of course, they love kidnapping stories, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I, I see that we have a lot of new names up here ready to ask us uh, questions. Um, but before we do that, Todd, in terms of your book, any special uh, promotions or appearances going on besides this one that uh, we might want to know about? And, and uh, there is a Kindle and an audiobook version of it as well, right? There's no audiobook version yet, though. There are 
There really should be. We should definitely get the actors to, to read it, don't you think? I mean, that would that, be a lot of fun. Be, that would be uh, <laughs> a franchise. So, the forward's written by William H. Macy. I'll just call it Bill. We'll get Bill to do that. It'll be no problem. And yeah, you can buy it at the usual places where you like to buy books online. I know Shakespeare and Company has it if you're in New York. If you go to that, that link that I posted, um, toddmelby.com slash book, there's a lot of places you can click to buy it. So so yeah, thanks for the, the cue. I'm sure there are crass producers out there who've begged the Coens to consider some kind of sequel to Frago, you know, the further adventures of Sheriff Marge, you know, with perhaps with her toddler in the back of the police car or something. <laughs> well, actually, which leads me to a quick question before we get to questions. The mm -hmm. TV series Fargo, which has been ran for really a long time on television. Uh, how closely were the Coens involved in that? Well, they're the executive producers of that. So, mm -hmm. you know, they get they get paid for their intellectual Cashing property the and they get paid for being executive producers. But did you know there was also a, a uh, a, a made-for-TV series that, that only had one episode. And that starred Edie Falco <laughs> from Sopranos fame as Marge, and then Bruce Bonney reprising his role as, uh, as Deputy Wow, Lou. Edie yeah. Falco and, and Sheriff Lou together, that, that would be, well, this is probably pre-Sopranos Edie Falco, is, is that correct? Correct, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah pre-Sopranos, right, right. Wow, I did, I did not know that. That's great. Well, well, good, I'm looking forward to questions. I wonder what people have to say. We, we have a good batch of questioners here usually. I'm sure we will. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be your um, host for the questions today. And I see Daniel has a question. Daniel, do you want to um, unmute yourself and turn on your video? Hey, you're muted, Daniel. Daniel? You've just unmute yourself. Lori, you have to, you have to hit that button. Oh, over Daniel, and then Daniel can unmute. Gotcha, gotcha. Sorry, guys, my first time. Here we go. All right, finally. Hi there. Um, I would like to offer sort of a further comment on the fact that your average Joe in the street remembers Fargo for the violence and the dark humor, but as Todd pointed out, there is a warm beating heart here. Um, I want to remind everybody, first of all, that the very last scene of the movie is Marge and Norm in bed together, illuminated by the TV light. And they're just saying wonderful, nice things to each other. And it kind of restores your faith in marital love. Um, but in particular, we keep coming up with the Mike Yanagita scene. And the fact that that scene was added late I think has something to do with the fact that they use a pseudonym for their editing. Present day filmmakers, no longer in the studio system, are often involved in the whole process, conceiving, writing, producing and directing, and of course, editing. Back in the studio days, these were all sequestered in the various departments. But nowadays, it's very important for someone who has been through the process of making the film to put on a different hat when looking at it as an editing project. You can't relate to it as your child that you have nurtured from birth. You have to look at it as the guy from down the block who's paying 15 bucks to see it in a theater. What are you going to make of it? And I think Roderick Jane's voice was clearly telling them, we need a scene with Mike Yanagita. We need to warm this up a little bit and show in particular how good Marge is at dealing with people. She is just a marvelous person. And I wish I knew her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah, I no, I think, I mean, Frances McDormand has said that, you know, film is an, is, an, is, an ed, is an editor's medium. And when I think of the great work of Martin Scorsese, I also think of uh, Thelma Schoonmacher and how fantastic she is. And, you know, the team of Schoonmacher and Scorsese, you know, working together. So I think uh, editing is one of those overlooked you know, oh yeah, skills well, by those of us who aren't in the business. It's called the invisible art because the audience really doesn't know an edit when it comes by. That's part of the strategy. But right. anyway, I must sign off with recommending something. This <laughs> is a coffee table book about right. the Coen brothers. And I recommend it very highly. It's very intelligently done. And one thing that's included in it is a very lucid interview with the aforementioned Roger Deakins, who is kind of a personal hero of mine. I often go to movies because he shot them. But he has one interesting anecdote about 
how he set up a shot in True Grit that he thought was just perfect with a mountain in the background that was gorgeous. And Joel and Ethan come up and say, no, kill the mountain. It's too interesting. And there's a whole thing going on for the next half a page about what they meant by that. Hey, Daniel, could you put that book up one more time? Yes, of course. And just to, remi just to remind everyone, oh, yeah. if you want to yeah. ask a question. And I, yeah, that's a, yeah, he's right. That's a, that's a really good book. And the author's name is Adam Naiman, and he's Correct. a film critic. So I put his name in the, in the chat for anybody who's, who's interested. Thanks, Todd. Sure. Um, so anyway, uh, they do talk at length about how the Coens like to design shots that are often not for pure pictorial interest. Yeah. Um, I won't go into it much. I don't want to spoil the fun of reading that interview, but it's a good book. And so is Roger Deakins as a DP. He's one of the geniuses still working. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Um, we have um, Jean Aaron. If you could unmute yourself and start your video. And just to remind everyone, if they want to ask a question, um, to raise your hand at the reactions. And Daniel, if you could mute yourself and kill your video. Thank you. Go ahead, Jean. You have to unmute yourself. Hello. There you go. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, this last week I read uh, the obituary on Vice President Walter Mondale, who comes from many, uh, Minnesota. And uh, towards the end of this big long thing in the New York Times, it mentioned how he was particularly fond of the uh, Cohen brothers, which I thought was a very interesting comment. I mean, it's all Minnesota. And I thought that was really charming having seen this. But my question is, uh, were the Cohen brothers uh, willing to speak to you, Todd? Uh, were they chatty and did they want to talk about this or they've just moved on to other things uh i didn't interview them i really really wanted to interview them i you know sent out multiple requests mm -hmm. um a few other people i didn't interview either i mean the thing about writing a book about you know something like like this is that you're never going to get everybody um right. but you know the folks who i did talk to had a lot to say about them plus they gave uh, multiple interviews about the time the movie came out and they appeared at the walker art center um an art institution in Minneapolis and, and I got access to that. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I have a lot of material, you know, from them speaking about the movie and then a lot of things other people had to right. say about them too. Yeah. yeah, well, it was probably even better hearing from all the people around them who kind of gave their take on the whole process. So. Sure, absolutely. All right, great, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. If you could, un if you could mute yourself and turn off your video. Um, Jan Janelle, um, if you could, um, unmute yourself and start your video. There she is. Hi, Tom. Um, Hi. I have a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I grew up in Hedinger, North Dakota. And um, are, you, are your parents Tom and Ruth? They are indeed. <laughs> yes. Very. And, and I'm actually visiting my sister now, about three miles south of Hedinger. Okay. And my yeah. Well, we'll have to. You have to send me a note offline, and we can have a little. I chat. will. I okay. will do that. Yeah, because yeah. I have a very close uh, relationship with your family. Um, I wondered about the theme music. Was that a Nordic? I'm all Norwegian, so I pick up on all of this. You know, the, <laughs> the fiddle, the fiddle, is it a fiddle, a violin? Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a particular kind of Swedish fiddle. So Carter Burwell, who was the, uh, the composer uh, that the Coen brothers have worked with, I think on all their movies, yeah. He was inspired by some traditional Swedish music for, 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 for that, yeah. I had read somewhere that that the it was inspired by the Norwegian folk song "The Lost Sheep." Does that sound? Does that, that's what I have read on in one account? You know, I also wanted to interview Carter Burwell. I didn't talk to him, and now you guys are finding all the people who I didn't talk to. <laughs> but I can tell you a lot about other stuff as well. Okay, well, I'll I'll send you a note, Todd. Okay, sounds good. Good to, good to see you. Thank you, Janelle. If you could Janelle. Just turn up your video. Um, someone asked a question earlier uh, during the session if uh, you could explain the three cents stamp at the end. Oh, right. Yes. It's like, like there's a part early on where they do this like slow pan of, of the duck and whatnot. 
and it really doesn't pay off until the end of the movie. So if you could please explain that. Sure. So Joel and Ethan Cohn uh, grew up um, near a family called the Houtmans. And indeed, three of the brothers from the Houtmans grew up to be duck stamp painters. I mean, there are people in real life who professionally paint ducks and they can enter something called the U.S. Uh, duck stamp contest. And it's a it's it's sponsored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, Group, which is part of the government. And the money goes towards um, conservation of, of, of wetlands so that duck hunters and you know, can have something, you know, can have, can, can, so can, hunt. <laughs> can hunt, exactly. So they can hunt. So like I interviewed Bob Houtman and he's one of the three brothers who do this in real life. And um, so, yeah, so the duck stamp contest that they're referring to, you know, it's not the real kind of stamp that you would put on a letter in mail. So that's, you know, the brothers kind of took literary license with that. But, um, but yeah, there are, if you Google the Houtmans, um, you will be able to see their actual real life duck stamp paintings. That's the competitor that Noam refers to in the film. Is that right? The same, the same last name? Same last name, exactly. Yeah. And, um, and so the, the unfinished um, duck painting that you see in the movie is, is done by Bob Houtman, who I did talk to. And um, I said, you know, whatever happened to that painting, Bob? And he's like, well, I still have it. Like, you know, <laughs> like, I'm like, wow, we should auction it off or something or, I don't know. So I think it maybe should go in the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences new museum that they're putting together. That and the original wood chipper. We need to get Barbara. people in the door for that. Right. right. Or the Smithsonian. <laughs> 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 um, so one, one final question. Um, there seems a lot of people are uh, asking about the relationship between Frances McDormand and uh, and her relationship with one of the brothers. Could, and if the brothers were willing to speak to you, could you address that? Yeah, well, Francis is married to Joel Cohn, and they met, you know. What's the, the timeline screen. like? Oh yeah, so the timeline lies. So so Joel and Ethan cast uh, Francis in, you know, in the very first movie, Blood Simple, and so they, you know, started to work together. Eventually, fell in love, uh, got married, etc. So at about the time Fargo came out, they were adopting their son Pedro, and um, so anyway, so they'd been married for many many years by the time. Fargo came out. And then Ethan, he married a film editor by the name of uh, Trisha Cook. Uh, so both of them married women who were in the movie business. Interesting. Um, well, thank you guys so much. And thank you for everyone coming today. I'd like to, at this point, turn it over to Sean Moore. Sean? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Todd, thank you so much. That was so great. Um, again, it, Todd, is it toddmelby.com? Oh, you're, I guess you're muted now. So maybe I won't be able to ask you that. Um, I just want to, I just want to remind everyone where they can get the book. Todd? Uh, yes, it is. Um, it is toddmelby.com. Yes, okay. it is. Okay, so I wanna make sure people look for that. And I wanna say thank you to Todd for joining us today. We, we really appreciate your being here. And um, for those of you who don't know, I am also from Minnesota, from Minneapolis. So, oh boy, we were really, really glad to have you here. We appreciate it so much. Oh, don't you know, for sure, for sure. It was so great. So at any rate, I'm gonna turn it over to Max because that's enough. I'm sure that's enough accent that you wanna hear, but um, Max is gonna talk a little bit about his next lecture. So on May 2nd, we have our next, I wanna make sure everyone knows this, our next talk back is next Sunday. It's not two weeks from now because of Mother's Day. And we are doing um, the movie uh, Chimes at Midnight, which is an Orson Welles movie. And then the following Wednesday, on the 5th, um, Max is going to be doing a lecture on Orson Welles, and I'm going to let him talk about that a little bit. Thank you, Sean. I love the Midwest uh, accents you gave us. Well, we're, it's, uh, we're talking about another, the Midwest theme continues because the subject of the next big talk I'm doing for New Plaza is on a Wisconsin boy from Kenosha named Orson Welles. He has been maligned, misunderstood, slandered, and I hope we can maybe set the record straight on May 5th. This will give you a little taste of what we can expect to see. Well, that's going to be uh, for New Plaza Cinema Online. Ladies and gentlemen, 
by way of introduction, this is a film about trickery. forward yeah really looking forward to that i think it's going to be super and um <clears throat> just a couple of other things you saw Lori churchin help us with the questions today a few weeks ago we talked about the facts the fact that matt um saul is going on to do bigger and better things and so Lori is going to step in for our sunday talkbacks so you'll you'll hear more from Lori in terms of being our our host and uh, thank you as we work through all of the, the changes. We appreciate that. Um, and so we're, we're just looking forward to seeing you. You can, you can find the information about the upcoming talks at our website, newplazacinema.org. So just a reminder, it's um, Sunday, May 2nd and Wednesday, May 5th, if you're interested in those. So thanks for joining us. Always great to have you here. Bye-bye, have a good night. <laughs>